Hello and welcome to our fifth week of the 3 P seminar series that's made possible by a collaboration between the Cure Parkinson's Trust, World Parkinson's Coalition and the Van Andel Institute. I'm Michaela Johnson, a postdoc in Patrick Brundon's lab at the Van Andel Institute and today I'm co-chairing the session with Lisa who will introduce herself now. Hi, my name is Lisa Bergquist. I'm also a postdoc at the Van Andel Institute. Thank you all for joining us today. So an exciting new feature we've included for today's Zoom is if you look at the bottom black panel of the screen, there's a polling feature. So at any time during this session, you can click on the polling feature and answer any multiple choice questions we've posted there, which we can then discuss either in the Q&A portion at the end of the session or in the Facebook 3P discussion page. So today we have a, a theme session driven by patients, uh, patient advocates. So our first speaker is Hugh Johnston, a patient advocate who is the chair of the Toronto Western Hospital Movement Disorder Clinic. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Uh, patient advisory board and today he was presenting on Parkinson's age and incidence and prevalence. Our second speaker is Benjamin Stitcher, a Parkinson's advocate who is the founder of the website The Tomorrow Edition that includes many, many interviews with top researchers and physicians to create a platform to bridge that divide between the research world and patients. And Ben is presenting on a wish list for neurodegenerative research. So on that, I'll hand it over to Hugh. Um, he will now share his slides, then Ben will do his presentation and we'll have a joint Q&A portion at the end. So please submit your questions to the Q&A throughout. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone see that hopefully? Uh, so let's start here. Uh, we're going to talk about age, incidence and prevalence. And um, We're going to get this slide to paginate, which it's not. There we go. Okay, so let's start with some of these quotes. Uh, these are all live quotes uh, that are on the internet today. Um, they're all referenced. And all of these quotes were facts at one time. In fact, people did have the average age of onset of Parkinson's at the age 60 at one time. And one thing about this data is it's a bit, it's a bit moldy, it's kind of old. If you look at uh, an average age of onset of 60 and you believe the average time from onset to mortality is 12 years, that uh, kind of adds up to a number that's not much over 70. And that number uh, doesn't jive much with the fact that most of the patients are over 75. And so what's up with that? So Dr. Hans Rosling has done a bunch of research and have others on what people believe. Uh, and what they believe tends to be what they learned when they were young. Um, the research shows that even CEOs do this same behavior. They learn something, they tell stories about it, and they weave that story into their learning and they don't update their information unless something really gets their attention because other things are on their mind. So an example of this uh, from Hans is, he does a slide where he looks at uh, deaths from natural disaster and, and shows, you know, are they going up? Are they going flat or are they going down? They are in fact going down, but um, people in Sweden tended to be pretty biased the other way. Uh, the people who were at his TED talk were pretty even and even chimps got the better answer than anybody else. So let's go back. Does anybody remember the name Hohen and Yar? There's an old one for you. Um, Hohen and Yar did a study that pegged the average age of onset of Parkinson's disease at 55 years old. That study was based on data from 1949 to 1964. And at that time, if you were YOPD, in other words, 50 and under, you were a pretty fair sample of the population of PD cases. And sadly, at that time, perhaps because the average male 
didn't make it much past 65, uh, about 80% of the Parkinson's patients were, were already gone by age 75. So if we update that information to 1990, in the 90s, mid 90s, the data was saying something closer to 70 years of age as an average age of onset. And uh, what I found was really interesting in the literature was often you'd have meta analysis and these great studies from the 90s would get lost in the averages and we would revert to the older bits of information. So let's look at something more current. Uh, in Canada, we have a highly urban population that has a very, pretty good health record and one particular code that codes for Parkinson's disease. And so the information is pretty good. The age of onset here in Canada, boy, that doesn't look like 60, does it? Have a look at the graph. Doesn't look like 65 to 69 either, does it? Or even 70 to 74. So what does it look like in the UK? Well, the UK data is the same. This one's for the people who like numbers and tables. If you look at the new diagnosis cases in the study, 1,207 in that column, age 75 to 79. That's the peak. We'll get into why the incidence rate peaks a little older and it has to do with mortality again, but we'll do that in a bit. So we took that and said, okay, it's Canada, it's the UK, so what? Well, when we go and we look at the same data for the US, for Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, it's all the same. Um, you'll see here on this graph that the Germans and the Canadians tend to have a higher incidence rate per 100,000 person years. And if you look at the population pyramids for those two countries, you'll find our average age is older than the other countries like the US, which is a bit younger, particularly in California, where the population tends to have higher birth rate. So let's look at a bit of the fine print here. This is something that people often bring up. And frankly, what they bring up is perfectly uh, correct and factual. The fact is that often those YOPD people, they're not counted accurately. Uh, by age 50, perhaps it takes three, four years to get a proper diagnosis. People aren't thinking about Parkinson's when you're in your 40s. We know of someone who, it took seven years to get a proper diagnosis, perhaps even longer. And so for YOPD, those numbers are a titch on the short side. Um, the number of cases on the older side as well are somewhat understated, and in particular, Many people see Parkinson's symptoms as just getting old, they don't seek treatment, and they're undercounted. So let's look at incidence and prevalence then. Incidence turns to prevalence. And if you look at the information here, it's pretty clear that Parkinson's disease, if you look and line them all up and put them in a gym, they're a pretty old bunch. And that the YOPD are gonna look like they're pretty rare. Look at the bars. Even Ben doesn't even qualify for the graph. He had it so young. Look at the UK. Again, a pretty elderly lot. But then let's look at the YOPDs. Again, they're very, very small percentage of cases up to 49. Now that number was a much larger percent back in the days when Ho and Yin Yar were doing their thing back in data from 1949 to 1964. So wonder if that cutoff really is valid. We'll, we'll think about that a bit. But if you look at this graph, where does that say to you that age becomes a big factor? So what really happened over this period of time? Well, a lot of things, we've got some stuff in our new book that came out by some of our leaders in the field and they, they point to some of the environmental factors. Uh, but the biggest single one is people just got older. Uh, life expectancy is significantly different between where it was in the 1950s and where it is now. And even in the last 20 years, it's gotten quite a bit better. On the front end, 
ch uh, children mortality and infectious disease helped, and on the back end, all of the work that's been done on chronic disease. So what is the risk of Parkinson's disease as you get older? And this is a fascinating study of physicians. There's over 22,000 male physicians in the US. And the data is pretty accurate because you'd think they might know if they have Parkinson's disease because they're docs. Uh, and the lifetime risk adjusted is almost 7%. This data is a little on the crusty side. It's uh, published in 2009. So maybe a little higher now. And, uh, but the raw incidence rate, rate, even before the adjustments, is uh, much higher. So wait a minute. Everybody knows that you can die earlier with Parkinson's disease. Look at the, look at the odds ratio right here. It's everybody knows that it happens. Uh, in particular, you've got YOPD, whose life expectancy uh, is somewhere around 71. Those who are diagnosed between 50 and uh, 64, it's around uh, 73 years old and a bit. And uh, so, and you also have MSA patients, PSP patients, dementia Lewy bodies, and the more aggressive what we used to call malignant types of Parkinson's disease. And it it's a really is significant. And frankly, people do die from Parkinson's disease. This is a chart. The chart is people dying in the United States of Parkinson's disease. And if you look at it, they're pretty old. Look at the age groups there. They're very old. And why is that? Well, you just do the math. If you get Parkinson's when you're 75 on average and you're going to live 12 years, you're going to pass away when you're pretty old. Now, on the other hand, look at the mortality rates in the 55, 60, 65, and 70 age buckets. This is a very serious disease for a group of Parkinson's patients. So, What's this talk about? The average age of PD onset of diagnosis is closer to 75 years old. When you're in a clinic and you're a movement disorder specialist, that's not who you see. You don't see half of them older than 75 and half of them younger because you tend to see the more serious cases, the ones that need your movement disorder specialty. If, you're, if the patients are getting Parkinson's disease in their mid 80s, they may not show up to your movement disorders clinic. YOPD are a relatively rare group now as a percentage, perhaps no fewer, perhaps more than there always were, but as a percentage of Parkinson's cases, a, a smaller uh, a group because of the cutoff. And the wonder might be, does that cutoff need an update? Remember these YOPD people age is not a big factor. And so they have the most pure and the most uh, discreet form of Parkinson's disease that could be studied to try to come up with what are the associated causes and how do they relate. And if you, the cutoff is really small, you really make your population of patients really small. And this old saying of, well, it's okay, uh, Parkinson's, you'll die with it, you won't die from it. Um, that's a real paradox, and guess what? You can actually be very old and die earlier. Those two sentences actually do work in the same sentence and are a fact. So if that's the case, then if we think about uh, diseases that are trying to get research funding and money, what is it that makes people really pay attention? Perhaps not so much to something where no, you're not gonna die from that. So. Okay, now, so here's my question to you folks. What are your hypotheses about why this data matters? Who among you is gonna grab this one? There's a paper to do here, go get it. The information's all out there. You can get the permissions, write it up and go. Uh, so postdocs, over to you. All right, I think that's my cue to begin. Thank you, Hugh, for that 
uplifting talk. Um, but it is, it does strike at how much of a burning platform Parkinson's is. And I think it's something that doesn't get accentuated enough is that this is a disease that significantly curtails one's, not only one's ability to live a full life, but one's lifespan as well. And so I think if there was a better understanding of that, it might help uh, make Parkinson's more of a burning platform for more people. Okay, but now I'll go into my talk. My talk's gonna be quite a bit different from what Hugh had to say, but hopefully just as enlightening. And I'll close my video so we can, how do I close my video? Stop video. Okay, so here, my wish list for neurodegenerative research. Uh, now I'm gonna be bouncing a little bit all over the place here. Um, I'm gonna be going from one topic to another, but at the end I'll try and sum it all up by presenting the actual wish list that I have for everybody. To begin with, I want to focus a little bit on our brains and how beautiful our brains really are. I mean, look at this picture that you see here. It, on first glance, it might look a little bit un unintelligible, but your brain quickly figures out exactly what's being said here. Intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Um, Stephen Hawking, who I think all of you know very well. Uh, and I think that's a particularly poignant thing to remember in the times that we're currently living in. There's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot of unprecedented events going on in the world, but humans have the unique ability to adapt to things very quickly. It's what makes us who we are in many different ways. Uh, and I think it's something that we need to really take to heart as we, as we go forward with encountering this pandemic that we're facing. You know, there's a kind of uh, cliche Chinese saying that uh, every crisis is an opportunity. And even though that's kind of not exactly true in the literal sense that the Chinese people actually meant it, or the Chinese person who came up with it actually meant it. Um, this is an opportunity for us to change the way we've been doing things. And so I've put together this wish list in hopes that it might help spark some change in how we go about doing neurogenerative research. But first, let's go through some of the basics. What are the basic, basic elements of doing research? Well, there's basically five major agents that are involved here. There's the clinic where everything basically began. Patients walked in, had some symptoms of something weird going on, and it was reported by doctors. It was then picked up by basic scientists who tried to figure out what's going on underneath here, what's actually the root cause of this clinical phenomenon that people are experiencing. Funding bodies then play a major role in deciding which of those avenues are most worthy of pursuing, and which ones might have the best chance of being translated into a proper therapy. It then gets picked up by industry, which tries to make that into a actual viable therapeutic strategy that we can take advantage of. And then the regulatory bodies come in and we have to get everything past the goal line in some sense. I'm gonna be focusing mostly on the first two aspects of this in this talk, the clinic and the basic scientists. And one kind of thing that I've been harping on for anybody who's listened to my talks before is that the overarching goal of most basic science and a lot of what happens in the clinic as well, unfortunately, is the research paper. So much of what we do is centered around getting published in the right place. And while it's very understandable that anybody in the system might see this as an, a laudable goal for people to attain, it should not be the end goal that I think we are striving towards. And what I'd like us to try to do here in the time that we have away from the clinic and away from our laboratory benches is to think more about how we can re reorient these goals and to think about how we can actually make science in the sense that uh, the main goal is what it should actually be. Now, there's also something, a crucial element of research missing from this equation. Often, I I've gone to a lot of clinics, I've gone to a lot of basic science labs, and I see them very much disconnected from one another, but I also see them very much disconnected from what they should be built towards or they should be built around. And that is the patient. And as you can see, when the patient is involved, it adds color to everything else that goes on. It gives life to everything else that's going on. A quick side note here, all of these images that you see were automatically generated by PowerPoint. Uh, so you can see the inherent bias that's in, that we have in our systems and in our and in every aspect of life about what uh, a patient is and, who a pa and the capabilities of a patient. But what I would love to see going forward is the patient-centered more, a more patient-centered approach to research and basic science and even the clinical aspect of how we 
manage and treat these diseases. And now there's a lot of talk about patient-centered research and how to actually go about doing it. Uh, but I'd like to present a couple models that I think have done a pretty good job of integrating them. One that I've recently become a part of is the Patient Advisory Board, the Toronto Western Hospital Movement Disorder Clinic. In Toronto, we have the clinic right next door to the Basic Science Laboratory. And now we've started to this Patient Advisory Board in the hope that we'll be able to better integrate all of these various pieces together and help produce more and help produce research that has a better chance of actually translating at the end of the day to something that benefits the end client, which is the patient. Now, going back to the clinic though, the root problem that I've come to understand as being fundamental to how we transform, how we actually treat these diseases is a better definition of the problem that we're facing here. And I'll show you what I mean through a series of pictures. We basically, at this point, we still use what we see. A patient walks into a doctor's office and they exhibit a variety of symptoms. Here are some of the most common symptoms that people with Parkinson's often experience. If, the, if they check off enough of these symptoms together, they get labeled as having Parkinson's disease. But what is this phenomenon called Parkinson's disease? Is, are these clinical labels that we use, are these visual cues that we have to give us clues into what the disease is good enough for us to be confident that these people that we've lumped together into this group called people with Parkinson's disease are part of the same group. Now we've all, I mean, it's, it's been widely known that this group is a very heterogeneous group. And there's a lot of lip service that gets paid to uh, calling them a heterogeneous group of patients but there's very little practical uh, efforts being made to actually try to figure out how to distinguish one patient from another. Uh, and it's very obvious for anybody who's spent much time with patients, just how different they are. And for a lot of basic researchers, what I'd rec one of the best experiences that you can have is to go to the World Parkinson's Congress. The next one's gonna be in Barcelona in 2022. You'll see about a thousand patients. I remember walking down the halls of the last one in Japan and you see about a thousand different cases of Parkinson's disease as well. So what we really need is a, what I'd love to see is a better, is more attempts made to actually define what the problem is that we're trying to solve here. Um, I, I often wonder if it still makes sense to have labs that are called, or labs that study the genetics of Parkinson's disease or the molecular, under, the molecular underpinnings of Parkinson's disease without that clear understanding of what it is we're actually solving for here. Uh, I also like them to be a little bit more integrated into a more holistic approach of integrating the patients with the clinic and the lab all together at one. Now this, to get a better definition of what we're actually dealing with here, it's going to start, I think, fundamentally with the hunt for biomarkers. This is how we've done things in the past. This is the standard approach to looking for biomarkers. We have this group of patients that we have that we call patients with Parkinson's disease. We subtype them based on some of their clinical phenotypes, and then we try to see, and then we take a bunch of samples from them, analyze the data, and see how they differentiate from one another. In many ways, I think that's, I've come to understand, I think that that's the wrong way to do this. We have these pre, preconceived notions about how these people should be clustering together, and then we try to f match the data to those clusters. Instead, I think we should be looking for a new approach to looking for biomarkers, which is something that I, which is what I'm doing here in Cincinnati, Ohio at the moment. With a wonderful team here led by Dr. Alberto Espe, we're on a new hunt for biomarkers. And it basically looks like this. Essentially what we're gonna be doing here over the next five years is we're gonna be recruiting 5,000 people, 1,000 healthy controls, 2,000 people with any form of Parkinsonism, and then 2,000 people with any form of dementia. We're gonna be taking all sorts of samples from them, and then we're gonna be stripping those samples from their diagnostic label. So the people who analyze the data are not gonna know which, what kind of patient this particular data came from. The hope is that the biology will be able to tell us more about these diseases than any clinical phenotype ever could, and that the biology will be able to help us guide our new approaches to developing therapeutic strategies so that we have more specific subtypes of each of these diseases. And it might be the case that they overlap as well. Uh, it might be the case that some people with Parkinson's disease and some people with certain forms of dementia 
have the same underlying root cause that's driving their disease forward. Uh, so we might be using the same uh, therapeutic tool on a person with Alzheimer's and a person with Parkinson's disease because they're the same, for example, the same kind of neuroinflammation driving their disease forward. Now, if you want to learn more about this program, I'd highly recommend going to, well, it's called the Cincinnati Cohort Biomarker Program. And you can find more information about it at ccbpstudy.com. Uh, and it's something that I'm going to be spending a lot of time trying to push forward uh, over the years to come. And if you have any questions about them, feel free to bring them up during the Q&A session as well. The next part of what I want to harp on here is our mental models of these diseases. I've come to realize, or I've come to believe anyways, that there's a giant gap between what we know about these diseases and what we need to know to properly intervene. And I tried to find an image that does a good job of portraying what that gap is. And I think this is a pretty apt image of that chasm that needs to be breached. For those who don't know, this is a, a scale model of a mouse brain next to a human brain. It's very telling for a lot of different reasons that I'm not gonna go into right now. But unfortunately, I think this is kind of part of the reality that we have to deal with. What we know is only a small fraction, I think, of what we're gonna ultimately need to know to properly intervene in all that's going wrong in the degenerating human brain. Now, in addition to that wide chasm between what we, need to, what we know and what we need to know, there's also some mistakes made, I think, in how we choose our targets. Um, I think a lot of people have seen something similar to this. It's still the research paper that drives a lot of our efforts into how we choose our targets. And there's a law, I think, that should be plastered on the ceilings of every medical lab in the world and every research lab in the world. And that is simply when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And you can look at the example that's given there. But basically what it's saying is that what drives research forward is often these scales that are used to define a person's career. And while it's un very understandable from the point of view of the researcher who's trying to make a career for themselves in this field, it doesn't always align with the needs and desires of the people that they're trying to help. And what this has created is this. This is a cumulative total of all the GWAS studies that have been done around the world, not just in Parkinson's disease or neurodegenerative diseases, but in all GWAS studies. It comes from the Structural Genomics Consortium uh, out of Germany and out of Toronto. And what they found essentially was that the amount of research is going up pretty rapidly. The amount of research that's being published is going up pretty dramatically. But the amount of actual genes and proteins that we're studying is actually decreasing of late. So we're doing more and more research on fewer and fewer targets. Uh, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, I feel like this is kind of reaffirming some of the biases, the inherent biases that we have. Now, so how can we do a better job of this? How can we do a better job of deciding which targets we should be choosing? Well, there's a long standing debate between hypothesis versus hypothesis free research, and which one is the better model for us to be pursuing. Now, in some ways, this is very much a false dichotomy. I mean, we have biases that are inherent in who we are as human beings. And you can call them hypotheses, you can call them biases, but in many ways they're one and the same thing. So it's very hard to do a true hypothesis-free research. Uh, and this becomes very important when you really start to understand the molecular underpinnings of who we are. And I'm sure some of you have seen this graph before, but I think it's very much worth pointing out. This is the map of all metabolic pathways in our body. And you can zoom in and see in exquisite detail just how complicated and intricate we are as a system. And this system very much has to be considered when we're trying to think of therapeutic strategies to do. Because the way science works, or the way I've come to understand how science works, is that we pick essentially one of these molecular pathways, we've gathered some evidence as to why it might be important, and we tweak it in the hopes that it's going to have some effect on the symptom or on the disease that we're trying to modulate. But this just speaks to the incredible difficulty in trying to do that. And what I think is going to ultimately be necessary is that we go away from the understanding that any one pathway is going to lead to the outcome that we want. 
we're going to need a much more, again, to use, I don't know if the right term is, but much more, not holistic approach, but we're going to have to be able to target more than one pathway at a time. Now, there are some quote unquote dirty drugs that do a good job of this and that do hit upon multiple pathways all at once. But we have to find a better way of going about doing this. Now, it's a very difficult problem to solve. And it's one that I think John Hardy summed up very well in an interview I did with him when he said this. Once you've got two or more variables, it becomes incredibly hard to work out what is important. Everything we do is dependent upon solving one variable at a time, which is very inefficient. No one has come up with a better way yet. I think solving this fundamental problem is going to be integral to pushing research forward in the years and decades to come. Now, on to the next thing. Ah, uh, yes. So, as we go forward, we're going to need better, I think, mental models of what we're dealing with here. Again, while we want to be as, well, I, I very much believe in agnostic research and trying to be as hypothesis-free as possible, there are limits to how far that can go. I also think it becomes just important to have an, an, a structural idea in your head of what's going wrong in a person who has this disease. Uh, now, one of the best, in my humble opinion, one of the best uh, attempts that was made to try to come up with a more, with a, a better mental model of what these diseases are was this paper written by myself and Michaela Johnson, who's on the call as well, as well as Patrick Brunden and colleagues, uh, and Lena, Lena Brunden and Valerie Labrie, all at the Van Andel Institute, who, think, who I thank for hosting this talk. Um, so this is the model that we came up with. However, it's already, how old is it now? I think this is about two years ago that we put this out. Um, I've since kind of reevaluated this and thought a little bit more about it. And I've come to, I think, a more a better understanding of what's actually going on deep inside. This is what I came up with. Ta-da! Now, I hope this is very clear and easy for everybody to understand. But in case it's not, I'll try to break it down and make it a little bit more legible. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the model on the left than on the right, but if you want in the future, I can break that down for you as well. So I've come to understand it as being, uh, as changing the triggers, facilitators, and aggravators to something a little bit different. The first group is something called what I've termed susceptibility factors. So things that you're either born with or that you accumulate over time that make you more vulnerable to these diseases, that make you more likely to get one of these neurodegenerative diseases. However, that by itself is not enough. People can live long lives with one of these things going wrong and not have any of these problems. In order to get to the next stage of disease or the next stage of uh, progression in one's disease onset, it requires a trigger, something that comes along and exacerbates the problem to the point where it starts to spiral out of, spiral out of control. However, even at this point, the body has enough innate uh, defense mechanisms that it's able to handle these problems and get it to the point where it doesn't really become a life-threatening illness or it doesn't really affect one's life considerably. However, if you add in the final ingredient, which is the aggravator, it becomes a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, now we can debate what the actual lists of the things are there. These are some ones that have been proposed lately that I'm particularly interested in. But these are just some examples of the things that can be brought together to bring about to lead to onset of symptoms and the onset of the disease. Now, another way of thinking about it in case, and I'm going to skip through this one pretty quickly because I'm running a little short on time. But another way of looking at it is like this. So in the top left, you have three kind of, and, and I, I, I don't want to say by any sense that this is the model that we should be doing. What I want is for people to be coming up with their own models. I think this is a very important exercise that helps people really get, get a more, uh, get, just get a stronger basis in what they're dealing with and helps them to try to understand the whole of what we're trying to tackle here. Because in the end, while researchers spend their careers diving deep into one specific gene or to one specific protein, it's important to always remember how it's connected to the bigger picture that we're trying to solve here. So this is just one potential hypothetical example of what might lead to like lysosomal dysfunction, for example which would be the uh, susceptibility factor in this case. 
And then on comes along either some kind of trigger or some kind of event that happens in one's life that makes it such that one becomes more susceptible to disease. But again, these are just a few examples of the kinds of models that I think about when I think about what, how these diseases actually come about. But moving on, the next thing I have on my list is to make science open and accessible. Now, for anybody who's heard me talk before, I think you've long heard me talk about making science open, uh, opening up science to as many people as possible. But I've come to realize lately that just open science by itself is not enough. It has to be accessible as well. And by accessible, I mean accessible to as many people as possible. Most people will never go and read the stale scientific papers that a lot of people spend their whole lives working on. What's, what really bridges the gap and helps people to really understand what's going on is for people to translate that work into language and into visual depictions that everybody can understand. And there's three people who I think have done a very good job of playing that role, playing that role as the bridge between the scientists and the general community. And it's helped really a lot of people come to a better understanding of what we're dealing with here. And the really important part that I want to stress and why this is so important is because we need as many minds as possible thinking about these problems. Um, the more accessible the research is, the more minds will suddenly open up to being able to try to answer these problems and try to tackle and try to understand what we're dealing with. And the three people I wanted to highlight were Simon Stott, who I think a lot of you know at the Science of Parkinson's, Marina, sorry if I butcher your last name, Nordergraf at Sparks PD, and Alice White at Cambridge. Uh, and all of them, you can find them on Twitter and on various channels. They've all done some really beautiful work in helping translate this, some difficult science to a general audience. And I just wanted to give them credit for all the hard work that they're doing. Now, I often get asked by researchers and by people that I come across, what is it that patients want? What do patients want from researchers? What do patients want from basic science? How can we better kind of serve their needs in a sense? And of late, I've come to realize that there's a lot, there's a lot of burning questions that patients have that they would like the research community to spend more time answering. And I don't wanna say that the research community hasn't spent any time answering these questions. There's definitely been a lot of attempts made to answer them. However, we haven't answered them sufficiently yet. They haven't been properly addressed and we don't have good answers yet. And the way we know that we don't have good answers to these questions yet is because they haven't translated to everyday therapeutics. And here's just one example of, of what we're, so essentially what it is to boil it all down is to focus on what we know works. There are certain tricks, there are certain things that patients have picked up along the way that they know work for them and that when you talk to patients and you really get them to let their guard down, they'll ask that researchers spend more time focusing on some of the things, some of the simple things that we know work. Now, like I said, there has been some efforts made in this field. Here's a recent example about trying to understand bradykinesia better. Um, but what I'm really getting at here are tricks and traits that patients pick up. Now, a lot of you might've seen this video that I'm about to show before in the, uh, over the weekend. I'm going to show it again now, if it'll play. It's a quick one minute video of one of the tricks that helps me anyways, better live with Parkinson's disease. And it was filmed with the help of Jennifer Sharma here in Cincinnati, Dr. Jennifer Sharma, who's a neurologist here. And I just wanted to demonstrate some of the compensatory skills that I picked up along the way. And it was inspired by some of the things that Bas, some of the work of Bass Bloom and Alfonso Fasano in particular.
Okay, so that's that. Uh, and I actually just translated this video into Chinese as well. So hopefully it'll be making the rounds all over China pretty soon as well. But now in summation, to sum up everything that I've been trying to say, here's my basic wish list for neurodegenerative researchers. One is the creation of more multidisciplinary centers. I don't think we should be having, I'm not sure if it makes sense to have an isolated lab just focusing on genetics and then an isolated lab just focusing on I don't know, some clinical aspect of the disease and then another lab just focusing on DBS programming or whatnot. I think that as best as possible, we should be doing more to integrate our centers together and to bridging some of the gaps that exist between those communities and in involving patients more and more than anything else, involving patients in every aspect of the research. I often, so even just a couple of days ago, I was sitting on a patient advisory board to a rather large pharmaceutical company. Um, and I just, there, there's like an instant, it intuitively makes sense to a lot of people to get this done, but actually developing models to make it happen is, I think, a difficult step for us to cross. But together, I think we will be able to create some of those models more often. Again, to redefine diseases as well, to come up with more succinct and more discrete definitions of what these diseases are. I'm not sure labels like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or ALS really make sense when you look at the basic biology of what's going on underneath everything. We have these clinical labels that mash up, that lump everyone together, but I'm not sure they're going to correlate with what we're going to find in the underlying biology. And as long as we continue to use those clinical labels, we might, it might obscure our ability to actually understand the basic underlying biology. Again, the development of mental models. This is more of a training exercise than anything else, but I think it really helps to sharpen one's uh, skills into one's kind of holistic picture of some of these diseases. Again, make science open and accessible, bring as many people into this as possible so that we had as many minds as possible working on these problems. Pay more attention to what works. There are basic tricks and tricks, and there's all sorts of other skills that patients have picked up. I mean, since I shared that video, I've gotten dozens and dozens and dozens of people reaching out saying, oh yeah, bicycling works for me in much the same way. Some people have like golf drills that they work on, soccer skills that they work on, badminton, all sorts of things work for certain individuals, but we don't really understand why at this point. Uh, and if, I think if we were able to really tap into that, that understanding of why these things work and turn them into more, turn them in, and try to turn them into therapies so that I don't have to walk everywhere with a basketball in my hand just to get the same kind of benefit. And then the final thing I want to say, going back to the first thing I said, is I think we have a great opportunity at this point in history. I think it would be a shame if we all desire to go back to the way things were. I know a lot of us are antsy, a lot of us are getting cabin fever at the moment, and a lot of us hope that we can go back to the way things were as soon as possible. But I think it would be a real missed opportunity if we all just went straight back to the way things were prior to this pandemic. I think this is an opportunity to reevaluate re how we do things uh, and, to re and to forge a new way forward that leads to better chances of success for or how we define success anyway, uh, because at the moment, or the way we've been doing things up till now hasn't translated to a lot of success. Uh, so this is an opportunity, I think, to try to reevaluate some of those strategies that we've been using. And with that, I'll say thank you. And I think it's time now for our Q&A. Nicely, thank you so much, Ben and Hugh, for those very interesting and inspiring talks. So we're going to move over to the Q&A portion now. And we have a first question from Melissa Massa. She says, is there an avenue of communication where early investigators building their line of research can get feedback and input from a panel of patients? So yes, I think there's lots of tools available. I think one of the best that's out there uh, is on Facebook called the Parkinson's Research Advocacy Group, started by Martin Taylor. It's about two to 3,000 patients at the, I think we're close to 3,000 patients at the moment. And I think we do a good job of making sure that the patients that are there are all well equipped to answer some of the researchers' questions and to work with researchers. And I think if you go on there, you'll find a lot of patients that are very uh, willing and very much hope to be able to work with researchers to develop better th therapeutics and develop a better understanding of Parkinson's. Thank you. And we also have a question from an anonymous attendee uh, pointing out that maybe there's an impression uh, that a lot of the PD research are 
kind of stuck on these old uh, ideas and old preconceptions of what the disease is. But there are uh, a lot of early career scientists that might have other thoughts. And then what is your input from your perspective? How can we help change? We as early career scientists helps change that perspective that we're actually having new ideas and new thoughts. And there are some movement in the field. Well, I think this is on some of the older researchers in the field to be more willing to adapt to some of these new ideas. And it's a difficult thing to do because research, whole research centers are built on some of these older ideas that we've had. And these ideas stick around for decades as a result uh, without being properly scrutinized. And some of them live well past their sell-by date. Um, so I think it's really incumbent upon some of the senior researchers in the field to try to be a little bit more willing to adapt to some of the new ideas that some of their younger colleagues might have. Hugh, I think, wanted to add something to that. Yeah, um, I've seen this one in business as well. CEOs tell the story of how things work and how everything works based on everything they've learned throughout their whole careers and their deep knowledge of what they're working on. And it's very hard sometimes to be able to put up things that make them go, mm, wait a minute, uh, maybe we want to look not just the way we think it is, maybe there's other avenues that are worth looking at. Definitely. So we also have some questions to Ben in regards to the biomarker study. Yes. So Susan Buff is wondering, will the Cincinnati Biomarker Cohort Program complement the MGFF PPMI initiative? So we'd like it to be able to complement them. However, because the fundamental starting point is different, it's going to be hard. Although we're going to do everything that we can to integrate the information so that uh, we make use of all the incredible work that's already been done before. So she also wonders, will the data be shared across the two efforts? Yes, I think we're going to try to do everything we can to make it as open and accessible as possible. And also uh, in regards to that from an anonymous attendee um, to Ben, you were talking about uh, heterogeneity in PD, which is of course true. Uh, but in the group that you're, uh, you're using 5,000 individuals, do you think that's powered well enough to see, find biomarkers for specific subgroups? So the short answer is no. I mean, we're going to do the best we can with the resources that we have available. Ideally, I think we're going to hope to get this up to at least 20,000 people over the course of the next 10 years. But I think our starting point is going to be 5,000. Uh, but yes, I think we're going to need to power it way up to get to the results that we really want. And then uh, from your point of view, do you feel like researchers in general are open to meet with patients, Parkinson's disease patients, and like, is that also maybe more for the clinical research or more of the basic science labs? Or do you, from your point of view, do you see interactions from those labs? So there are certain labs that really want patient input and that do a good job of reaching out to patient communities and really integrating their thoughts and ideas into what's going on. But there are others that don't do as well, as good of a job of it. Um, I know early on in my quest to try to contact researchers and to, and to get into my foot into the door in some of these places, it was very difficult at the beginning. It wasn't until I had kind of a name that was recognized already that I was able to gain access. Um, I wish that every research lab was paired with their local patient community uh, and really did a better job of integrating every, everything that's going on. One of the best examples I saw was actually the first lab I ever visited, which was down in San Diego at the Scripps Research Center at the time, but it's now Aspen Neuroscience, where they really do a good job of making sure that the patient voice is integrated into everything that they're doing. Thank Funny you. thing happens when you involve the patients. Sometimes they give you some tips that make you uh, have a more successful uh, outcome. <laughs> yeah, and also it's, it's very much a two-way street, I find. I mean, not only do patients benefit from that interaction, and not only do researchers find that benefit, but there's all sorts of uh, trickle-down effects of sorts that get that gets put out as well. I mean, that the Aspen Neuroscience Group is a perfect example. I mean, they've had a lot of tremendous success lately. And I think it's because of their ability to integrate patients into everything that they're doing. 
Yeah, if you think of Tilo Kunath and, and the folks up in Dundee and what happened with even how they engaged they were up there and we ended up uh, discovering Joy Milne as a result in the smell of Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. Um, but the Joan Mill and smelling Parkinson's, if anyone's unaware of that, you should definitely be looking into that. Uh, a question for Hugh and about where you're talking about the age of onset and how that may not be accurate any longer. Do you think that the definition of old age has also not changed to what it was previously and whether that's influencing what people are saying is old versus young onset PD? Well, it's interesting. What what is old age? Uh, people people are living longer because we're able to solve for the things that were making them uh, leave us uh, at a younger age. We're able to deal with chronic disease. Um, as I said, say with some of my relatives that are really old, they have about three or four things that'll get them, but they're still kicking and they're doing great. They've got their marbles and away they go. And so um, I think the average age of onset is important in particular um, because it leads us to believe certain things that we might want to challenge, but because we have this view that the average age is younger, we don't challenge those things. Uh, and so, um, and for a, one of those examples is the young onset definition. What, you know, what, what's up with an arbitrary cutoff? Because everyone believes it's and knows it's an arbitrary cutoff at 49. And are there all sorts of research candidates that could help us to, to discover the heterogeneity and the causes of the heterogeneity in Parkinson's disease if we start poking away at the folks that are 50 to, you know, 59? And um, yeah, so um, is that a decent answer? Hopefully uh, we covered the topic. Yeah, I guess just a quick follow up on that is, what do you see the benefit if it was changed to say, anyone who gets it younger than 60 is considered young onset Parkinson's? How do you see that changing things in the field or for patients? Well, you, you, what you'd have to believe is you'd have to believe that age doesn't become a, as, as a significant factor until they're older than that age 60. And that as a result, you were able to, you were able to, to strip out patients that had a purer form of the disease, a more genetic form, a more trigger uh, caused form of the disease, a more severe form of the disease. And as a result, you'd be, one, you'd be focusing on those people who have the most aggressive types, the, perhaps the MSAs and the PSPs, and as well, the YOPDs who have a lot at stake. And you'd have a purer sample with less noise in the population that then you could strip apart into the biological mechanisms like the ones that Ben's group is working on coming up with biomarkers for so that you don't fall into this trap of you put everybody in one bucket and then you, you know, hope that statistics are going to, is going to try to tease out an answer when there may very well be many different kinds of Parkinson's diseases. Yeah, thank you for that. So we have a question here from Vidya Dahara. Uh, how much are patients worried about non-motor cognitive dysfunctions compared to that of motor dysfunctions? I don't know if he wants to take the lead on that one, but I would say it's definitely high up on the list of a lot of people's worries. I mean, the motor challenges are difficult and they're annoying, but you're still there. You're still the person that you were in many ways. Once some of those cognitive difficulties set in, it can really change the lived experience in some very dramatic, dramatic ways. Yeah, it's almost like we have this, this term Parkinson's disease and we think it's a motor condition when it's both. And uh, not only that, when you sample patients, you find that if they rank their symptoms by what gives them the most trouble, it's the non-motor stuff that gives them tremendous amount of trouble. And at the end of the day, the two things that are the most, perhaps the most challenging are swallowing and its risks and falls and their risks. So those are, you know, one of those, I, I guess they're both motor, but we don't think of swallowing as a motor, a, a motor function, even though it is. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, one last little thing as well. Uh, in Toronto, we're thinking of uh, doing a uh, integrated care model and they're getting that going. And one of the things is they're actually having psychiatric care plugged right in with every single patient in, is, in a group. And that can be a significant part of the treatment plan that gets a, shuffled off to the side. Definitely. Uh, question for Ben from Samuel. Uh, ben, you've spent a lot of time speaking to MDs, scientists, CEO, CEOs, etc. in the field. What do you think private money is doing so much in the space of solving many of the problems that exist in classical science? Um, it definitely gives a little bit more flexibility to the people who are the beneficiaries of that private money. Uh, it usually comes with a few less strings attached and usually gives the person involved a little bit more flexibility to go in different directions in different areas. Um, while we can't rely on it entirely, I think it's a bold new approach. Although it is hard because it's not as rigorously scrutinized, it's not as rigorously uh, implemented as well at times, but if put in, put in the right direction, it can do a lot of good. So it does make the game a little bit more unfair as well. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle has a question about the prodromal phase of the different age groups. That's Do you have any? Uh, yeah. One thought here. That let's say we take these Parkinson's patients in research and we're able to take some of the prodromal symptoms that are very discreet. For example, 80% of RBD patients uh, REM sleep behavior disorder will convert to a synucleinopathy at some point on a lifetime uh, risk basis. That's definitely, if you could take that stream and combine it with a, a group that's not confounded by age and other pathology, perhaps related to uh, whether it's A beta or tau or, or other things that complicate the picture, that you might be able to really zoom in uh, a bit better and then when you get the biomarkers from the projects that like the one that Bennett is working on, then you could really get down to, okay, here's a kind of Parkinson's disease. Let's do a trial on that. And the study, as long as we power it enough, can actually give us an answer that statistically is going to work. Yeah. Uh, this might have to be the final question for the session. We're running out of time. Um, just proposing to both of you, how do you suggest we can engage with those who aren't willing to participate? So maybe some of those more senior researchers or things that might not be willing to get the patient involvement. Do you have any suggestions on how this could be phrased to try and get, sway that opinion and change minds? Um, well, I think it's up to, in many ways, up to the patient community in that sense to hold people's feet to the fire. Um, while, uh, of course, we want to be, we want to have the right tact in how we do these things. Um, I think there's a lot of power in the patient community if it was exercised properly to guide research in the right directions and to make sure that we're um, testing things appropriately and making sure that our resource, resources are being spent in the right way. It's best for us at the end of the day. Um, one thought I would give is that uh, take heart, you have some of the leading researchers in Parkinson's disease, some of the most cited authors in the field. I'll pick a few out just because they're, they're handy, Tony Lang and Patrick Brinden, and you have Bass Bloom, and you have uh, Michael Oaken. These people are engaging with patients and learning from them through their, in their research, and they will lead the folks that uh, the rest of the field to be able to do that as well. Good point. Okay, on that note, I'd like to thank the speakers and thank everyone for signing in and listening in today. Uh, if you have uh, would like to continue this conversation, refer to the 3P discussion Facebook page. We'll post any questions there that the speakers can continue to answer or we can have a dialogue about that. So thanks again to the speakers. We appreciate your time and please Anybody interested on learning more about therapies for synuclonopathies, register for this Thursday's session at 12 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.